uh, where two survivors are going to tell their story. We had a third, Max Drimmer. He escaped from Auschwitz. He also escaped from us. Uh, even though he's on the schedule, you won't see him today. But we have uh, three other very interesting people who will be speaking to you. Um, Paul Benko will be the moderator. Paul is a Romanian survivor of the Holocaust. He's a professor emeritus from Sonoma State Field of Biology. Um, and he, he will be moderating the panel. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I want to briefly introduce the speakers. I'm, I'm not the participant today. I'm just the moderator. What I will do is repeat your question so everybody hears the same question. But uh, uh, our speakers uh, uh, this afternoon are first Lucy Green, who is to my left. Uh, I, will, I have just read her book, which is titled From Ashes to Life, and very appropriately. It is a, a very touching and a very insightful uh, history of a young woman's experiences in the end of the 30s to, till 1945. I highly recommend the book to you. I'm my understanding of what the operative end of genocide is. And uh, Lucille Eichengreen is an eloquent spokesman for that. Our other speaker is Mr. Max Schein, who holds a singular distinction for the length of his stay in concentration camps. Mr. Schein, uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Eichengreen came from Hamburg originally. Mr. Schein came from Berlin originally but they had noon swim. Well, with that, uh, I now turn this over to Mrs. Eichengreen. Uh, can you hear me? No, still not? It's better? The series is titled Survival in the German Camps. Well, actually, very few of us managed to survive. Uh, most of us did not make it. The first camp in which, the first camp in which I, to which I was brought was a large ghetto. The ghetto was a slum area in an industrial city, and uh, the houses had neither water nor toilets. There were outhouses in the yard. A small room was occupied by eight human beings. Um, it was surrounded by barbed wire. There were no underground sewers in British sites, like for instance in Warsaw. There was no news coming in from the outside into the ghetto. And uh, it was one of the oldest ghettos, or one of the ghettos longest in existence under the Nazis for the simple reason that we had factories that supplied for the Germans various items of necessity, forms for the Wehrmacht, the boots, the straw boots for the Russian front, the, um, the metal containers which they carried around, the mess kits. Um, we had rug factories that made rugs out of old rags for the Germans. They were shipped back to Germany. We made hats for the German women. We made corsets shipped back to Germany. There was hardly an item which was not made or produced in the ghetto. The uh, ghetto was run by a German, Bibov, who was a very good businessman and a very good Nazi, similar to the famous Mr. Schindler, except uh, he had to deal with 150,000 Jews at any given time, rather than uh, two or three. It was just a, an, an encircled area, a compound with the guard houses every 10 feet. And uh, there was no in, there was no out. There were, there were two radios 
which did not work very well, but um, we tried to repair them, and occasionally there was some news. But we were so sealed off that we did not know of the progress of the war on the outside. We did not know when the United States entered the war. We did not know of the existence of the death camp of Helmo or the death camp of Auschwitz or um, anything else. It was just totally unknown. And even those in the ghetto in high positions have known either did not believe or did not pass on this type of information. Uh, resistance was impossible. We had no means, no armament, nothing. Uh, and the Germans were brutal. There was some resistance, mainly for lack of food, uh, protest marches, and the Germans just did not uh, allow it. Uh, found a smuggler or a young boy who would call under the wires and try and get food from the other side. They would either shoot them or hang them. The ghetto itself was under German control, but the Germans very cleverly um, got a Judenrat or a group of Jews to be in charge uh, of the immediate um, work or dirty work of issuing orders, and the head of the Judenrat was Chaim Rumkowski, and a very controversial figure. He was a very simple man, a very uneducated man, a very shrewd man. I worked for him for several months. I, he was an ardent Zionist. I would not call him a decent human being, but this is my opinion. Uh, what the world would have called him had he survived the war, I don't know. There were those who thought he saved the ghetto, which in the end he could not. And there were those who termed him a collaborator. Um, the cemetery at the edge of the ghetto has oh, between 60 and 70,000 unmarked graves. There was no way we could mark them even the walkways are used as graves because people just died. They died from hunger. Everything else was just peripheral. It was uh, typhoid, it was dysentery, it was anything else, but you died of hunger. And it is a very painful death. How you survived it, I really, there is no answer. You survived partly because you were young. You had a little bit more resistance. You survived to a large extent because you had friends. And I could not imagine having, having gone through the war without friends. Uh, the ghetto was liquidated and started to be liquidated in August 1944, a destination unknown. And every day they lo loaded a string of cattle cars with people, we received a loaf of bread, and that was the only time that I really had a loaf of bread which I could devour in a day or two days. And uh, after many stops and starts, because the railroad lines were used for army transport, we were pushed at four in the morning out of the train. The platform was lit and we had no idea where we were. Within 10 minutes, men were separated from women, children from adults, old ones from young ones, and we were marched off into a barracks. We were asked to drop everything, watches, jewelry, clothing, and we were herded into the showers. By that time, the word Auschwitz had dropped, as little meaning as any other name. It meant nothing to us. But when we stood in the showers, the whisper like a grapevine went from row to row. And uh, it stated that either water will come out of the shower heads or gas. And I think, I was 18 years old, I think it was the first time that I really realized that I had no whatsoever. 
not over my life, not over my thoughts, not over my being, over nothing. There was a little bit of water that day in the showers, and the SS in charge stated that um, the gas chambers are overloaded, we'll get you tomorrow. They were so busy they did not get this particular group tomorrow. They shaved our head, which for me was very traumatic. Uh, a woman or young girl without hair, and I saw my reflection in a window, was just an egg-shaped head with two protruding ears. And I really wondered whether the hair will ever grow back or whether there will be enough time left to live and to see the hair grow. Uh, we stayed at Ritz, I can't tell you exactly for how long. We stood at Appel, we had very little food, we had the, uh, the usual suicides, people running into the electric wires, not wanting to live, people dropping from exhaustion, and uh, if it had lasted much longer, I don't think our particular group would have made it. We were clad in a rag, no shoes, no underwear, just a rag. And uh, one day we were told to uh, march past an inspe a German inspection committee, three SS, uh, take off the dress, carry it in the left hand, and go fast and not look right and left. Some of us disappeared on the left, they're never seen again. The others were loaded, given a second rag, and were loaded into cattle cars again. The commission consisted of two SS, and supposedly one of them was the famous Dr. Mengele, or I should say infamous. The cattle cars started and stopped for several days. It was very hot. It was late fall. No water, no food, nothing. When the doors were thrown open, we were free harbor uh, of the city of Hamburg, which had that summer been heavily bombed by the British and the Americans. And a large part of that city and the harbor was in absolute shambles. They used us to clean the rubbish, but they gave us no tools, no shovels, no rakes, nothing. We used our bare hands and the infections and the scars remained for a lifetime. Many of us, as the rain started in fall, in winter, caught pneumonia, some of us died. Uh, all of us, I think, had a leftover of tuberculosis eventually. From that camp, we were transported to another camp, which was a, an outside camp of the famous French camp of Neuen Gameth that housed French prisoners. And there our work consisted of uh, erecting or building prefabricated houses out of concrete plates. A plate was about the size of this table, which of course is much too heavy for two women to lift, but lift we did. And uh, we built those prefabricators for the Germans that had lost their residences or their apartments in the bombing of, uh, of the city of Hamburg. The war continued. We had no news at all. Occasionally I would glance, a, a glance at a German newspaper and of course, all the information was distorted. The Germans were still will winning the war. It did not have the uh, saying, our work makes you free, but it was similar. The thing that struck us most to the right and to the left of the main camp avenue were two mountains of shoes about the height of this room, old shoes and new shoes small ones and large, but just shoes, no legs, no feet. Bergen-Belsen at that time was totally diseased. Uh, the main problem was typhoid. 
and people died in such horrendous numbers on a daily basis that the Germans did not come into the camp. They would bring the little bit of soup or the little bit of bread, if there was bread, to the camp, to one of the camp gates, and then several of us would take it into the barracks. But they themselves were afraid of entering the camp. The dead were uh, thrown into large pits. At first, the Germans insisted that all gold teeth be removed and handed over, but towards the end, they didn't even bother with that. The pits were open, the bodies were decaying. The bodies were green, and it is a sight that I have never seen before. I don't think I'll ever see it again. The British Army liberated the camp on April 15th, 1945, driving into the camp with huge tanks. We had no idea who they were, what they were. We saw that the uniforms were khaki, and um, the markings on the tanks were obli obviously not German. They did not let us out of the camp because they were totally unprepared for what they saw. They, the officers, several officers came into the camp. They asked if anybody spoke English, and there were five or six of us who said yes, and we were still able to sort of walk. And they used us that first day, from morning to late at night, from barrack to barracks, to talk to men, to women, to children, some of them totally unable to even respond because they would not survive. In fact, 10,000 people died after liberation because there was no salvaging a life that had been deprived of food, of sanitation, of, of anything. I worked for the British all through 1945, first as a translator, then in, as, as an interpreter. I worked for the war crimes department that looked or tried to look for Germans or for the SS trying to arrest them. On one such occasion, in a very casual conversation, the fact was mentioned that for a while I worked in, in an office of a camp and I accidentally had remembered or memorized the names and addresses of 42 SS. I wrote them down, they checked it out, they didn't believe me, and eventually we picked up on a truck, 40 of them, all innocent, of course, and two of them were sent up by the uh, American army from the south. Uh, I was a, uh, at the first hearing, I was a witness. I remember I was asked whether I preferred to speak German or English. I said, please, English. I don't know what they asked me, and I don't remember what I answered. It is just one of those black spots looking at the Germans that I just could not cope with. It just is gone. After incident, I received threatening notes, and the notes supposedly were from family members of the SS, the ones that sat in prison now. The uh, British decided to drive me to Holland, from Holland to Belgium, and then into Paris, because Paris and London were the only two places that had a, an American embassy for a possible visa or possible uh, journey to either Israel or New York. The um, journey into Paris was not entirely legal. We had some problems at the Dutch border not having a passport, not having proper papers. And in France, I had the problem of um, having a short visa for six weeks. And in six weeks, I could get a visa for New York. Um, France used to have a prime minister by the name of Leon Blum, who also was in one of the camps as a political prisoner and as a Jew. He was a broken, elderly gentleman, and I managed to find his address. His housekeeper did not want me to see him. 
but I said, give him two words, Auschwitz and Neuengamme, and he knew. And I got permission to stay in France, and then in March 1946, I received the visa for New York. I sailed on a merchant marine ship, and the passage one way was close to $700. And you had to be very happy that you even got that much passage. The money came from my family, family in Palestine. I had no money ever. And arriving in New York, a friend had called the Daily News. I had never heard of the paper. And they asked some questions, and the only thing I could say was no comments. I did not want to speak. I did not speak for 50 years. My children did not know. They might have had a suspicion. Uh, I was overseas during the war, but no details. They only found out when they were about 20, when they were in college, and then they did not get all the details. They only got the details two years ago. It was one way for me to adjust and live a normal life. For other people, it did not work, or it might not have worked. I cannot say it was the right thing to, or the wrong thing to do. It was a matter of choice. And uh, the reason I think I'm talking now is that after, I was one of the children of the Holocaust. After I am gone, It'll be a matter of uh, academia, it'll be a matter of books and libraries, and uh, it'll be secondhand information. So, um, I hope we have learned from the past, but I don't think we have. And that is said. Thank you. Mrs. Eichengreen, and we're going to go on now and ask uh, Mr. Schein to present his background. My story is a little bit different. I was born in Berlin, and when I was 16, the war broke out, the Second World War. And as a so-called Polish Jew, I was in a concentration camp for 2,000 more Jews in, from all the vicinity of Berlin. The Nazis really had no intention to put us in a concentration camp because we were supposed to be internal. Because the war broke out and we were so-called enemies, Polish citizens. And the Nazis wanted to see if the world would react. But unfortunately, the world couldn't care less. So we were put in a camp, within a camp, that means built a isolation within the concentration camp and the Nazis would come in at any time, the so-called block leaders, and would hit us with anything and everything they had. And we were young and strong. We were supposed to be cleaning the barracks because the one thing the Nazis were scared of was of infectious disease. So we had to clean the barracks. And during the night, of course, many of our friends and comrades would die. We had to pile them up in the bathroom sky high. That's much of it, because during the night they could not be transferred. The next morning we had to bring them back to the uh, uh, crematoria. And after six weeks to eight weeks, the Reichsführer SS Himmler, who was in charge of all the concentration camps and the SS, said put the left ones, the, the one who survived, especially the young ones, to work, because Sachsenhausen consisted of mainly prisoners, approximately 25,000 political, criminals, antisocial. And we, the Jews, were no more than 2,000, 2,200. So when we were ordered to go to work, there was no real work for us there. It was by that time the winter time, and it snowed tremendously. So we were ordered to take our coats inside out and load them from snow. And the snow was moved in a huge pile from one corner to the other. And of course, the SS would stand there with whips and sticks, whatever they had in their hand, and hit us all over. And of course, not only the SS, also the uh, so-called foreman and cabos. 
And many, many of our people died, of course, during these times. And of course, then we were ordered, some of us who would be able to learn a trade because many of the Gentiles would be released. And uh, I thought to myself, before I came in the camp, I could not vision to work because obviously I was a called Polish Jew who hasn't spoken word Polish and never left Germany. If I would get a job on the roof inside the camp, I would be maybe safer from the Nazis. So I volunteered and said, I worked as a roofer and I named a big company in Berlin. Of course, I never worked there, but I figured the name a big outfit might help me. And I was put in roofing detail. And after a few weeks, I was ordered to a DSS canteen. This is directly the outside of the camp. And uh, one of the highest SS leader, directly under Himmler, was supposed to visit this camp for general inspection. And uh, the SS was just as scared as the prisoner when such a high official would come to make it right. So they found out what, they would, what is his pleasure in food. And they found out he likes to have a very lean ham. And I was ordered to work, and uh, the, the uh, position, the, the uh, Cabo ordered me to remove one of the sections of the roof and make myself an angle and pick up a package. And you know what to do, deliver to Barack 44, which I did. But I had no idea. All these big packages were numbered. And I delivered this to the main gate. Everything went fine. And... Uh, I got a slice of this ham, which was like, and this one. And after this official left, the, com the chief of the kitchen goes to the commander and says, Commander, there was a ham missing. And this ham could not have been stolen by any, even the prisoners who work in the kitchen. It had to be by someone outside. And who worked on the barrack? The roofers. And I got handled over my ass because I, I said, I'm Jewish, I don't eat ham, which wasn't true. Because I figured if, if I tell him the truth, I am dead. If he, I might have a little chance. And I got so, such a tremendous punishment. And then I came into a special detail. I was supposed to be killed. But fortunately, the prisoners I did not give away saved my life. And after three years, in September 1942, we were one day ordered. There was a big table to come into the bathroom. And Sachsenhausen now, the difference is, German concentration camps, which were many of them, they were all built first, like Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald, Dachau, and many, many more. And the difference between a concentration camp and all the camps were built in eastern Poland, like Auschwitz, Treblinka, Medanik, these were extermination camps. In a concentration camp, they work you to death. And on top of it, you were disciplined and you were drilled like a soldier, ex just for punishments. We were ordered to the canteen, uh, to the bathroom, and ordered to lift our belts and give up our handkerchief, put everything on the table. And one of our older prisoners says, they're gonna shoot us, because there was no gas in Sachsenhausen. Everything was execution order, uh, just killed by hand. And they're gonna kill us, and they're gonna shoot us like animals, and we're not gonna die. We have done nothing. That if we're gonna die, then we wanna die, man. And he said, "We are, yeah, we are with you." And we tried the mutiny, and we were extremely lucky that the commandant allowed this to happen. In other words, he says, "If you're not gonna be killed, you're gonna go on transport, but I'm not permitted to tell you where you go. You're gonna go back east." But what he didn't tell you, told us, we came original with over 2,000 Jews, Jewish, Jews in this area. If we go, we had no idea what meant to the right, what that meant to the left. And my friend, Max Drimmer, was going to the left. And all the prisoners, all our friends who were to the left ended up in the gas because they had no use for them. We were ordered from Auschwitz I to build Auschwitz number three, which was the EG farm industry, a special Bunarek, they call this, approximately 12 kilometers from the main camp of Auschwitz. And I worked as a roofer again, and one day I was ordered to build another camp about 100 kilometers from there, in the near of uh, Gleiwitz, outside of, you know, 100 kilometers from Auschwitz. And here I see three beautiful girls in civilian clothes, but doing some the truck came inside the camp, and I couldn't really see what they were doing. They were lifting up a heavy, a heavy uh, crate. 
And I said to another roof of mine, let's go and see what the I was very, uh, uh, I wasn't scared of anything. Obviously, I was in a camp then four and a half years. And uh, I see uh, three girls and they wore the Star of David, which of course is a Jewish monk David. And I said, are you Jewish? And you wear the Star of David? And they said, well, we are half Jewish. My mother is Gentile, her father is Jewish, but we have to do forced labor. And the forced labor consists of picking up all the debris. And I said, we have absolutely no way to survive, but uh, I want you to tell the outside world what has happened here. And uh, she came every week and I talked to her and then like, she couldn't come into the camp anywhere. And one day I asked her, what is your name? And so she said, my name is Marion Schlesinger. And I said, where do you live? So she said, why do you ask me my address? I said, you know, sometimes we don't have enough work here. And then the SS uses us to do some errand for them, picking up some work at the airport or whatever. Maybe we drive through your city and I can see your, your, your little street. So I put this, I don't know for what, but anyway, this street and her name I knocked into my head. And all the time I said to myself, the same street, I don't know what it meant. So anyway, one day the chief inspector, which was an officer of the SS, comes you know, from the construction on the roof to me. I want you to do these and these barracks. By now I was the first roofer. And he said, these and these barracks, and in four weeks I come back and give you more orders. He comes back four weeks later and, in the, and then he said to me, you know, when I give you an order, it is just like the SS inside. And I thought he was a civilian because he always talked nice to me. And they said, besides this, I ordered for you to, all your special workers get, uh, because this is a high priority camp for the Eastern Front, to get split. And he takes a slip out of his pocket and he reads to me five different items or eight different items of food, which we are supposed to be get in addition to our prison food. And I laughed. I said, I have never even seen. I said, I'm almost five years in the camp. I have never seen any food. He said, you Jew, you laughing? And he opened his coat, and under his coat, he's got uh, three stars and four stripes. He's a Hauptsturmführer, you know, high of SS officer. And he said, are you telling me the truth? And I knew now I, I did the fake. How the heck can I talk to an SS like this? He goes in the kitchen, and then, uh, of course, I did not know what was going on, but a friend of mine is in the kitchen at the same time, and he hears, overhears this discussion because he was picking up food for another other SS official. And this guy goes on the tele, and he said, I want to see all this food, this special food, which is ordered by us for these prisoners. And this kitchen chief, who is also SS, he says, I send that attention because you outrank me, but you show me your permission that I have to show you anything. You don't belong to the camp except for the construction. And the guy says, you're going to hear more from me when I get to Berlin. So as soon as this official left, he goes on the phone and calls Birkenau. I didn't know where he called, but my friend overheard this. And he said, we have a Jew here. He's an old prisoner and he makes us nothing but trouble. He said, you gotta take care of him before that other guy gets blind. And he's happy apparently, and my friend tells me then, how the heck can you gang up against SS? Your life is worth nothing. You must try as soon as possible to get shifted back to the main camp. Even, I don't know if this is gonna help you. I am transferred back to the main camp, and my, this girl I met there, Marion Schlesinger, promised to write me, which I shouldn't have asked her either, but she wrote a note. And actually, even if I would have found out directly, I would have no way of getting back to her, but it was very cleverly written, because there she explained that through him she found out where I was. And at the same evening, this friend, Mike Strimmer, who was supposed to be here, we are very old boyhood friends from Berlin. He comes to me and he says, I worked with a civilian out there in a factory. Jews would ever escape. But I said to him, I'm not gonna throw my life away, even so we have no chance to survive. But we have seen any of these escapees, we, and we don't speak the language. The Poles are not very friendly toward the Jews. We knew that. So where are we gonna go? We have no hair. The only thing we have is a tattooed number, which they gave us on purpose that we can't escape. He said, what this guy told me, it sounds terrific. So he tells me, he's a, Poli a Polish civilian worker. He works alongside him. He, goes, he, he lives 18 kilometers from Auschwitz, and uh, he works also for the underground. 
During the day he worked for the Nazis, during the night he worked for the Polish underground, blowing up and doing all kinds of things. And this order is to get two prisoners, who are all prisoners who have all kinds of knowledge about the strength and so forth of the camp, who can possibly help the underground as the front moves closer, the Russian. I said, I would like to talk to this guy if possible. And I had permission to go from the, from the camp directly into the factory because the guards were standing right in line there. And uh, he explained to me the same way. He said, I'm gonna hide you in here. If everything goes well, you're gonna be hidden for about 36 hours. And if nobody else escapes, which we hope, I have found already a spot and then we have to crawl for about a mile, mile and a half. I cut the wire like a moonless night and you're gonna walk one to two kilometers and you'll be picked up by an underground car and take you direct to Tito into the mountains. He was in charge of the international partisans. I said, that looks good to me. And besides this, I knew what I have done there will never go well anyway. So it took several days to arrange all this. And now I was ordered before the main gate one morning. And I come to the main gate. Here stays this chief gas master. And his name was Moll. I had known him already years before when I first came to Sachsenhausen. He just got an extra star from Himmler and then a special icon love for gassing the one or one and a half million Jew, whatever it was. And he said, don't I know you? And then he has asked you anything, even if it's not the truth. You have to say, you never dispute them. Otherwise, you are dead and be dead anyway, but you surely don't dispute them. Don't I know you from Sachsenhausen, which of course was true. I said, yes, sir. Didn't you lie to this chief inspector? Yes, sir. Didn't you get all this extra food? Yes. You just wanted me look, want me to look bad? Yes, sir. So he talks to this report leader who was in charge of the camp while the big brass wasn't there. And a um, few minutes later, a special truck comes with a few extra guards and I was shipped to Bergenau. And here in Bergenau, I see hundreds of people standing in front of the gas. It's my term. And I say to myself, how stupid everything goes to me. I got myself like a cat through so many years to the camp. Maybe I would have made it even, but now there's no more way to survive. And I was hoping maybe our commandant would come in here because I was a good roofer. I never had any disciplinary action against me and so forth. But th these were all just dreaming stuff. And all of a sudden, the gate opens. And you know, in Birkenau, there are small barracks where everything is fabricated for the prisoners would also do all kinds of work for the SS. And as high as the SS, the more access they have. And the SS, of course, are the ones who are stealing gold and diamonds which the prisoners bring all in. And they have the nicest things made for their wives. So here, a woman in civilian clothes drives on a bicycle. And as a boy in Berlin, I worked as a, in a bicycle. And it's about, I would say, 50 feet away from me. Her skirt gets caught in her bike, and a chain gets caught in her, bike, in, in her skirt, and she falls over. And I, I don't know what made me go, but I run, but the guard was right and behind me. I run across the street and untangled her skirt, and she has her arm on top of my shoulder. I was still bending down. And then the, in no time, the guard comes and has the machine pistol right in my rib. And uh, she said, you damn guard, you, do you know who I am? I don't care what you do with his prisoners, but do you know if you shoot him, this bullet gonna penetrate from him into me? Don't you know who I am? He says, no, I want your sergeant in charge. He comes and he says, don't you know who I am? No. And finally an officer comes and he stands at attention and he says, jawohl, Frau Hess, this is the wife of the chief commandant of Auschwitz, of all Auschwitz. And she, now her husband comes and then she said, Rudolf, this prisoner was so decent, I could have been badly injured. He tried to help me, and you are damn guards. You come, he, he wants to shoot him, and you know, I would have been shot the same way. What kind of, and he said, prisoner, what barrack you belong to? I said, commander, I don't belong to this camp. He said, what? So anyway, in a few minutes, I'm transferred back to the main camp again. And now, <laughs> but he had no intention to save me, but just, be, uh, he figured, this, nobody had permission to transfer this prisoner. Now my friend Max comes on with this escape offer and naturally I take it. So now we had to provide all kinds of stuff for our escape. Several things he could smuggle out like we were supposed to wear mechanic suits 
which had white, red stripes. Hair, we had no hair. We were allowed to let it grow a little, but we had to have about a three-inch spot cut right through the middle of the head so you'd be recognized, just so that the barbers save more time. So he smuggled a lot of stuff out, but two things we needed very badly, and one of them was a first aid kit, and another was, of course, some knives. In case we get caught, we're gonna kill ourselves, because there's one thing we know, we will never be Clive into the concentration camp. We knew well what was waiting for us. But at the gate, there were several block for the, the SS sitting there. They had nothing else to do, and they had a big list, and they knew who had permission to go to the factory. And they cannot grant you the permission. The permission is granted by the commandant or by the work detail, by the work t detail leader. So I extended attention and I said, uh, prison 70196, we should have permission to go to the factory. And he says to me, are you coming back? And I said, why wouldn't I come back? I said, you're so nice to us and everything is so wonderful here, you know? So, uh, but what I couldn't afford, I had in my pens, you see a wider pens, the first aid kit and the knives, the utensils. And he came toward me, and of course, as an old prisoner, you know all these tricks going on in the camp, so you, sometimes they tap you, and the last thing I could have, gonna be tapped. And unless he gives you permission to be at ease, you cannot be at ease. So when he came so close to me that I was scared he's gonna tap me, I made a step back, and fortunately, he did not recognize it. So he said, take off, he said, but you guys are supposed to be back a half an hour before the main commands come from the outside, because we are supposed to be counted in the camp. So everything went well. He hit us in an in a insulation there, six feet deep, put insulation wall on top of us, and uh, to our luck, nobody else escaped. At least a lot of prisoners tried to escape, not really to run away but just to kill themselves. They go into an isolated spot at the barbed wire, at the electric wire, and it takes a little while until they are found. Or they are just hiding away so they be caught and then they be shot. So anyway, we are hidden in there and now we have to hope is that not to our Joseph from the underground. Anyway, well, luckily the next morning he came, he dropped some food for us and he said, everything all right tonight, by 10 o'clock we are set. 10 o'clock arrives, and uh, I c there's unfortunately no time to tell you all the details. So 10 o'clock, we, on our stomachs, about a mile, I, over a mile, climbed to the spot, here, and almost we were cut, caught by, a, by one of the SS, but just fortunately we did not. And we walked one kilometer, two kilometer, three kilometer, and we said, Joseph, you told us one kilometer. And then we be picked up. He said, things have changed. The car which was supposed to bring us to the mountains cannot show up, something happened. You have to walk 18 kilometers to my hay barn, to the village where we live. Crazy. Well, he said, if you can go back to the camp. And he knows we can't go back to the camp, so we walked. And we had extremely many close calls, but we made it. And we were up on the hay barn for almost four months. And we made some plans for him and all kinds of information. And one day, my friend says, would you mind, because we felt very unsafe in this area, because he promised us, because we were still direct at the border in German-occupied Poland. And we, we figured we got to need some help. And my friend Max, he had a girlfriend in Berlin, also for mixed marriage. Would you mind mailing me a letter? And this guy, of course, was a bravado, obviously, when he helped us escape from the camp. So he said, sure, I mail it. I mail it under my address. So he mailed a letter, and we get mail constantly. Every two, three weeks a letter, and we get no mail anymore. And all of a sudden, we get a postcard, don't write anymore, and we know something happened. And three days later, it knocked on the door. German Gestapo comes with three dogs, uniform. Where are those Jews, the Joseph Ronner? got out of Auschwitz. And uh, they said there's another runner living in the city here and they brought him, sent him to the uncle and all of a sudden they come back and then they took off again. And the smaller brother and sister comes up and says, you got to leave, right? The Nazis gonna come back, they gonna execute all of us, where are we gonna go? And so he told us in case something happened, the end of the village lives his future father-in-law. 
Well, we go there and he didn't know nothing about us. So we sit there for an hour, two hours, three hours, so the guy comes back from Auschwitz. You know, he saw the SS standing there, so he jumps out of the bus and walks into the forest. So the SS checks the whole bus and they know he's not on the bus. So he figures if they didn't find me, they, that was the only of my house, I, they know I cannot be home. So he figured they will never come back here anymore. And we did not tell him so far about this special card we got from Berlin. We showed him the card. Of course, he uh, read and, and, and spoke perfect German then. And we said, you got to come with us. Something has happened. We showed him the card. He said, I will go with you tomorrow morning. So the next morning we went. And he said, you go ahead later. And a few minutes later, his future, or a few hours later, his future father-in-law comes. And he says, Joseph cannot come. He has been executed. And we are on your own. And uh, my friend Max says, we have absolutely no other way. We may as well kill ourselves right here. And I said, and I was always an optimist, even so it was so extremely bleak. I said, you know, by the time we go up and hang us, we're going to freeze the dead. We don't even have a rope. I said, but you remember, I told you about this girl I met in a concentration camp. I still have her name and her address. Why can't we try to get to her? He said, you're crazy. There's, there's a law, you cannot, you cannot take the street. We have no, pa no paper, nothing. How are we going to get 100, 103 kilometers from here? I said, we can try. So sure enough, the greatest mirror. We, got, we, saw it, we, we went to the first station in the morning at 4 o'clock, and we saw it, these 103 kilometers with a fast train. We're going to be there before daylight breaks. By daylight, we haven't even traveled 30 kilometers because every time something happened, all these trains, you know, they had to wait for the trains to the eastern frontier. And finally, we came to the main station that was in, in uh, Krakow. Krakow. All of a sudden, you know, there's sometimes in these stations, two trains come and then it's empty. And there were the SS with the special metal signs, the very Sicherheit service. Everyone was checked. If it was a military officer and SS, everyone had to show papers. And when they went left, we went right, and so far we were very, very lucky. And now it came, there was no train standing, nothing, and the two monsters came toward us. And we know we couldn't, if we walk away, they call us. If we run away, they shoot us. So what are we gonna do? So we were just standing, and all of a sudden, a guy came from nowhere. We don't even know where this civilian came from. He almost stepped on their feet. They grabbed him, and they were busy with him for a few minutes. And the two trains come, and we boarded one train. Now we come to the city. It was daylight. And we asked a couple of older ladies, this in the street is, in Niederwaldstraße. So they gave us the direction, and here, I forgot the number. And here the street, and so we found the house. And uh, Max says, you gotta be very diplomatic. And, but I said, how can I be diplomatic? I don't even know if they're still alive. And uh, so uh, here's the name of Schlesinger, and knock on the door, and, and, the, and the young lady opened the door, and I said, is Marion home? She said, no, she's at work. And already a stone fell over in my heart because at work, everything is fine. She said, you wanna talk to my mother? I said, yes, please. So she goes in, she said, mother, there are two mechanics outside. Uh, they are, oh, she said, oh, maybe her boss asked him to find out what's wrong with her. She was sick. And she said, you're not mechanics. Who are you? I, and I couldn't tell her. She was laying there. Maybe she has a heart condition or anything like that. I said, uh, uh, I met your daughter in the near of, from Auschwitz. She said, you are lying. If you don't tell me the truth, you've got to leave my house right. I said, Mrs. Schlesinger, I don't know what's wrong with you. Maybe you have a serious illness. No, no, she said, I have something on my leg. I said, you know, I was commanded, I was a roofer in Gleiwitz. Oh, she said, you were the roofer who was singing so nicely from the roof. And I had a nice voice then and was singing always, you know, and then uh, and nothing to do. And then, uh, yeah, I, I know about you. And, and, and then she called the father and told the help us and they hit us. And then the, we ended up, the father was a former lawyer here, a uh, former Nazi who defended the communists and all this kind of stuff. And we were hit by a multimillionaire for the next 12 days. And I don't have to tell you, this woman I'm married to next week, 48 years.
Yes. Mentioned that a number of SS knew that every SS member knew someone in the SS was committed to suicide. Does that make any sense to you? Do you comment on this at all? That, that you know about this at all? I'll repeat the question. The question, the question is that in Schindler's book, uh, it is mentioned that every SS knew someone who had committed suicide. Does this make sense to you? From the SS or from the prisoners? No, the SS. SS. Yes, I know of many as has committed suicide. Yes, as soon as they were caught or became close to be caught. After the war, especially when the Russians, see we were freed by the Russians. And when the Russians moved in, they were instantly looking for SS. And many, many people who lived in the city pointed. It is true. I'll tell you, at the end of the war, uh, I was in a camp where there were a great many Ukrainians who were about to be repatriated to the uh, Russian sector. And many of them had fought in the so-called Death Head Brigade, which was Ukrainian volunteers fighting against the Russians. And they were mass suicides. Questions? Yes? Sounds like one of you had knowledge about what the Allied uh, countries, you know, what kind of movement they were making as far as progress into freeing the camps or fighting against Germany. And one of you said you didn't have really any information about that. And I was wondering, what was your view of Britain and Russia? I mean, were you hopeful that, that they were going to, you know, release you? Or do them now? Do you feel grateful to them or angry that they didn't get there sooner? Or, I mean, I'm just curious what your feelings are about that. The question is, uh, what were your feelings uh, with regard to the Allies, and what was your information? Because one person uh, described a state when they were totally uninformed. The other person said that they were informed. And what are your feelings about the well, Allies I can, now? I can tell you about the Russians especially. When the Russians, they were so brutal against our own people that many of them who survived the concentration camps we are shipped to Siberia by the Russians, and many of them got killed this way. And we tried to intervene because we had some connections with higher Russians. And he said, if you intervene anymore, you're ending up in Siberia too. And we could never understand how anything like this was possible. Uh, we only found out as out. Um, I also found out much later that the Americans and the British knew as early as 1942 of the existence of all the camps, including Auschwitz. Aerial photographs are available, but they did not think it worthwhile to bomb the camps, which would have been for us uh, a much way of either living or dying. But we did not have the choice. The world stood still and watched and did not help. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering when you ended your, your speech to us with saying that you hope that we had learned a lesson, but it doesn't look like that. And right now, with the situation that's going on in the world and the that are being inflicted, taking the most media present at the moment, Bosnia Herzegovina, what are your feelings of what we can do to help bring about a resolution? The question is, uh, considering your statement, uh, what is it that you, you would do now to resolve the problem in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina? We have to put a stop to it. The logistics of it, uh, I'm not an expert. Uh, but this senseless killing has to stop because there is no, no excuse for it, there is no reason for it, there is no moral justification for it. Um, we have tried or successfully stopped lesser people than the people in Yugoslavia. And I think it could be, could be done through the United Nations, it could be done through the European community. But again, we have a, a similar case like we had in 1942. Nobody really wants to bother, and that is very regrettable.
next? Your comment? Well, I, I think it is very right. The only difference is you take, for instance, the European are the ones who should really take care of it. Everybody looks for them. And America cannot get involved in all these different actions. You cannot be the big policeman like America has been for the last 40 years. It hasn't gotten us any place. Europe is not interested in getting mixed, and as far as the United, States, the United Nations is concerned, the uh, Butrus Butrus Galli says, I am against airdrops, against the air attacks, unless it's connected with ground troops. And I think this is the wrongest, because one thing I know, the Yugoslavs is one of the strongest armies in the world besides the United States and a few others, and Russia and so forth. They are extremely strong. Tito has shown already in the early 50s, when he separated himself from Stalin, that he didn't need him, so strong he was. So that you cannot get involved over there unless Europe wants to get involved. Other questions? Yes. Was the objective of the supposedly society that protected the, the SS and spared them out of the country for uh, war crimes, was that actual fact or fiction? In Approximately how many SS officers and enlisted men are supposed to have survived the war? Is there any, are there any estimates of that? The question is, uh, was Odessa a uh, fact or fiction? How many uh, SS officers survived the war and how many took advantage of this possibly? The statistics are available through the Wiesenthal Center both in Los Angeles and in Vienna. Um, many of them went to Paraguay, to Uruguay, to Argentina. Eichmann was caught eventually. And uh, the escape was successful. But what really was worse was that after the war, the United States permitted a highly trained or um, influential people, some of them SS, to come to this country and uh, to work in armament, to work in technology. And this was done with the excuse that uh, we were really not friends with the Russians. It was a, um, a cold war between us and the Russians and we used the Germans. The Germans got away scot-free with very light sentences, if any sentences at all. A lot of them were admitted to England, to the United States, to some to France, but few. And uh, only a few recently have been caught. Uh, whether it was an organized effort or an individual effort is debated. I am not sure. Did you want to come in back? Well, as far as the SS itself is concerned, I have been in Sachsenhausen. And uh, just about a year ago. And there are two barracks still standing. One of them is where I was in. And it was the barrack that was set on fire by the skinheads and Nazis. But what uh, astonished me more than anything was, and I got it right here in paper I brought along, while the Russian occupied and had the uh, authority over everything, they allowed most of the Nazis, who were the biggest killers, to go free after 10 to 15 years. And this is just hard to understand. Uh, <clears throat> other questions? Yes. What? The difference between the Gestapo and the SS. The question is, what's the difference between the Gestapo and the SS? Gestapo stands for Geheime Staatspolizei or Secret Service, except that they were brutal and ruthless. SS is Schutzstaffel, which means uh, protective services. Um, the difference in their action, there was no difference in their actions. Uh, they were both equally brutal, but they were used in different areas uh, for instance, the Gestapo did not operate in, in camps exactly. The Gestapo operated in ghettos. Um, 
the SS was more of a paramilitary organization than the Gestapo. Uh, the Gestapo as a secret service was extremely um, well informed, extremely efficient, extremely ruthless. They asked few questions, they killed immediately and no regrets <coughs> whatsoever. Yes. Uh, in pre-war Germany, uh, Hitler played upon the uh, prejudices of the German people by uh, claiming that the Jews controlled all the money. Uh, it seems that this is a uh, belief that's still kind of popularly held in the United States. Uh, I just wondered if maybe you could, uh, being you know, living in Germany prior to Let me paraphrase your question. The question is, uh, Hitler, uh, Hitler's propaganda included the charge that Jews had all the money and manipulated uh, the, the German uh, financial uh, community. Uh, what is your comment? What, what are the realities of this? Well, I think if you want to be an anti-Semite, you can bring up any kind of an argument, but it is so untrue because the Jews were always a minority in Germany because at the, even at the highest, the Jewish population was at the maximum 600,000 out of a pop German population of 66 million. So you can imagine how much influence they have. And besides this, in Germany, for a long, long time, the Jews were not even allowed in a lot of different positions, like military, like finance. The Jews didn't take any part. Of it. And now I'm gonna tell you another thing. Even among the Nazis on the hierarchy, in, in the hierarchy, there were some of them who were so-called Jews. If I tell you today that Hermann Goering himself was adopted by a Jew, and if anybody while he was in power would have named, mentioned this, you know how long he would have lived. And several others were indirectly involved with Jewish blood. I don't think there were, there were many of the Germans who were even today, you, you read it from time to time, that comes up that Hitler wasn't even full German, full Gentile, and with many other, they're also in question. So where can it come up there that the, that the Jews are that bad? No, if you draw a panel that you hear this phrase in this country, the Jews control the money here. The next time Forbes magazine comes out and lists the 500 wealthiest American, look for some Jews in there. is, did you see your families after you went into the ghetto? My father was murdered in 1941 in Dachau after two years in Sachsenhausen and in Dachau. My mother died of hunger in the large ghetto. My sister, who was younger, was deported with a group of children. I think there were a total of 10,000 children. And they were about an hour outside the ghetto. We did not know that. We only found out much, much later. So there was no family. And the same story happened to most families. One member is alive, but uh, the rest is gone. Max? Max? Well, I wasn't in the ghetto. I guess you know that. Once I came in the concentration camp, I never seen my mother or any of my mother again. The only one I saw again was my brother. He is right here, and he went to Israel for 27 years, and he came to America in 1963. Yeah. I was curious about the tattoo or numbering on Mr. Shine's arm. Hello, Mom. Uh, there's the markings on your arm. Yes, sir. The question is about the tattoo on Mr. Shine's arm. Where, where do you receive it? Where did you get it? But many of them didn't last very long to work either. Unfortunately. But I just, excuse me, I just wanted to say something. 
This fella, this Polish hero who helped us escape from Auschwitz, we made contact with him. In 1989, we went back to Poland to try one more time to search for him. At first, we were very unsuccessful. We traveled with a report on KQED. And uh, we came in contact with the Catholic Church, with an official, and he promised, he was a formerly officer, high officer of the underground, he said, if this man is still alive, I will find him for you. When you're back in the United States, I'll let you know. Four weeks later, he wrote us, said he found his smaller sister and the brother, because he couldn't believe our story because there were never any Poles who saved really Jews out of Auschwitz. He said, they corroborate our your story. Because they were still alive. And as soon as we heard it, we contacted the Yad Vashem, which of course is the uh, army. We, we got a medal from Israel and we arranged his visit. He came to visit us here in San Francisco in 1990 in May. And we all were highly honored by the state legislature and uh, when Joseph came, of course, he was honored at the Presidio and at the Wiedenthal Center, and it was extremely emotional. He was our guest for five weeks. Unfortunately, in the same year, November of 1990, he passed away. But we were so glad to still have met him and be able to thank him. What is it today for both of you that you see in your lives that gives you the most hope? The question is, what is it for you to today that give you, gives you the most hope? Immediate basis is, of course, my family on a slightly removed level. It's my friends, uh, both current and friends from the past. And um, I hope that there is a future for my children. I think the biggest hope for me became and I was shaving of the head with this was a part of it. The damage is that the reason for numbers was to dehumanize people to reduce them to a number. Yes. Did you have any contact with Dr. Joseph Mengele? No. The question is, did any of you have contact with Dr. Joseph Mengele? I only saw him once during that one inspection. He was within touching distance, close enough to touch him. But at that point, I only knew that he was the doctor in charge of the hospital. I had heard that there were experiments conducted. I had no other knowledge. And um, that was the only time. I saw him in Auschwitz when, when we were assaulted to the left and to the right. And then he was right with the Commandant Hess and some of the other officials, and he denoted who would go left and who would go right. This is the only time I saw him. How, how, did, how do you feel that the world or people that you knew received from a concentration camp as survivors? I mean, did you find it harder to get a job after the war, or was it dipathy? I, mean, did... <laughs> I think the question revolves itself around what happened after the war. How did you respond? How did people respond to you? The classmate who brought me to New York looked at me rather strangely. She never asked a lot of questions. But we sh did not share the same opinions or the same interests. I wanted to go to school, she to make money. I wanted to keep my name, she, ought, uh, she thought I ought to get an American name. When I finally went out and got a job and I went back to school, I did not mention the past. Nobody ever asked, when did you come here? I said I was born in Europe, I was a Polish national, and uh, I'm trained in this and this, here are my credentials, and um, the past by choice, my choice, was not. Well, I have to say, I used the trade I learned in the concentration camp, and I became very successful in America. I worked very hard, and at one time, the German government wanted me to pay them restitution. <laughs> <laughs> We're having taught you trade, right? <laughs> of course, it's only a joke. 
left. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I must tell you an anecdote about the German government officials. It is a habit that when a person is hung, the family gets a bill for the hanging. And the bill includes the stamps for the letter which was sent. Question is uh, different. Uh, the question uh, deals with uh, the question heard that there are different techniques for tattooing. Do you know about were these experimental? Well, I can tell you uh, quite a few had infections because uh, this was not the tattoo done in the buffet. They would uh, use the same needle and then they just hit you and uh, they couldn't care less if if you got a you know a blood infection or whatever. And, and quite a few I knew had it. But I was young and strong, so I guess I just shook it off. Yeah. He could have done a lot for the Jews, but he did not. In fact, he sympathized with the Nazis. This is unfortunate. You know, I spoke several times at the St. Anne School in San Francisco. And uh, they were so prepared. They had huge tables with built every concentration camp. And it was amazed for me to see all this. That this and there was not one Jewish student, of course, in these schools. And still, they were so interested about the Holocaust. And they asked my comments about, just like you said now, about the Catholics. And I told them the same thing. And they were astonished. And they thought the Catholic helped them. And they helped and hit the, sure, a few did. I mean, a few Poles uh, did also help the Jews, but how many? You know, I have a list of the medals given out by the Yad Vashem, you know, the Israelis, uh, Saudi, and Poland with the biggest population of Jews, almost three and a half million, or three and a half million, they have no more than at the maximum 80 medals giving out, while you take a little Dutch country, they had the, the only less than the twentieth of the population, they have several hundred of the medals giving out. It shows you. The question uh, difference between today's Hitler and today's Nazis and the previous Hitler youth. They both um, bank on the same principle, and that is hate. There is no reason, there is no justification. They're selling hate. And it's really up to us not to buy it. We live in a free country. They are, of course, entitled to free speech, opinions, but if we don't counteract by talking, by reading, by learning, then they might get the upper hand, which of course would be very sad. Because there is a saying, to, today it's the, uh, uh, the Jews, and tomorrow it's the Catholics, and uh, then it's the gays, and then they came for me, and there was nobody to speak for me. statement that Mr. Uh, Scheinholz made about the neglect to have helped the Jews is probably a good generalization of the United States government along with the British government. That during those 30s that uh, where Jews were able to escape, we refused to allow them to enter our country. True. And then the British kept them out of Palestine. True. And they wandered around and ended up uh, in, in ovens. The comment is that uh, other countries, including the United States, Great Britain, and other places were as guilty uh, as others because they didn't allow a place for people to escape. Yes? Um, I was wondering, um, you said that you were put into the special part of the um, camp. Um, what, what made it so that you were put into the special part of the camp? Is, well, what, why were you put in the special part of the camp? You're talking about the early part in Sachsenhausen. Well, because I stole this so-called ham. I never admitted I stole it because I was ordered to do it. 
and this him disappeared. So for this, you see, the Nazis actually respected me, said I lied, but they still punished me for it. And the prisoners the same way. If I would have told the truth, many people have gotten killed, of course, I and many Jews would have gotten killed too, including me. From their experience, were women treated about the same as men or worse or better? Uh, I, I, I'd like to know a little bit about the sexual differences in the camps and so on. The question the is, was there a difference between the treatment of men and women in the camp? At first, the men were labor. When I was in Auschwitz, I could not work. I have a friend in Israel who swears he saw me in Auschwitz pushing a wagon. I wish I had pushed a wagon. I did not. Uh, women were used in different ways. Uh, they were used for the SS. They were used to a large extent for experiments. The barracks in which I was housed in Birkenau had a capo from one of the Eastern European countries. I'm not sure whether she was Jewish or not, but the corner in which she slept it was sort of cordoned off with a blanket. And when the one bulb that was used in the barracks was put out at night, NSS would come and spend the night with her. We suspected one of them when we saw him in the daytime by his cruelty, by his looks, but we were never sure. So women were used. Uh, she eventually ended up marrying him after the war. They ended up in New York, and I ran into her in New York, and uh, I have never been s this shocked in all my life. But uh, yes, women were used, and towards the end, also for hard labor. But it was a different time. Uh, there was no woman's equality, and uh, there were certain things that women were just not doing or were not used for. And uh, I wouldn't say it was easier or it was harder. It, it was just different. Max, did you want to come? I was never together with women prisoners. I heard a lot, but I was never in one camp together with them. Yes? How do you feel about the, the questions that have been raised about how many died in the Holocaust? Because there's been questions about, let's say, six million Jews died. And the questions are being raised like, where did that number come from? And if six million did die, how do we know they were all Jewish people? The question is, how, do, how can we verify how many died in the Holocaust and how do we know those were Jews and uh, so on? Normally, I do not dignify a question like this because documentation has been established mainly by the Germans. Um, in Europe, there is such a thing as that we would call Meldepflicht. That means if you live here, you register in this police precinct. And one of the questions on the question is religion and nationality. If you move from here to there, you go to the police station, you tell them, I'm moving. You go to the new police station, you said, I moved in here. So if you go back in Europe to the city halls, to the archives, to you name it, the proof is there, and the Germans are the ones who are providing the proof. Um, I was curious as to, as the end of the war came about, and did you have any foreknowledge in regards to changes in attitudes of the SS or the Gestapo? Were things coming to a sudden end, or was it fairly, for the most part, just a constant uh, treatment, and then one day the tanks roll in, or whatever well, the question is. Uh, let me just repeat it. The question is, did you have any forewarning, or was there a change uh, about the end of the war? Have you built, been built any place else? So when you have hundreds of thousands of prisoners all over Germany, which were Germans at first, and they still didn't know that concentration camps existed, and many of these people died too. still a prisoner. Well, I wasn't there at the end of the war anymore. I freed myself. 
didn't want to wait. <laughs> I was in Bergen-Belsen, and the only thing that changed that uh, 12 hours before the tanks rolled in, the SS wore white armbands on their left sleeve. But otherwise, nothing changed. And we couldn't figure out the meaning of those armbands. I mean, it should have been self-evident, but obviously you don't think very clearly. Uh, that was the only thing. Some were hiding, some were running, and some were arrested immediately. But sooner or later, we got all of them. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yes. As a comment, um, you, someone had mentioned earlier about what is the difference between a Nazi of that time uh, compared to neo-Nazis and these type of radical individuals today. I think what needs nice is that they were organized by the leader of the country. And God forbid that ever happening here. That is not the case today with the neo-Nazis. I hope that's just a very small group and and it will remain as such, but I think that's something that's supposed to be, should be recognized. And I think the other thing um, I would like to mention is there's a big controversy about denial by the Germans of what has happened. But I think in all fairness, um, many, 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 many people did not know that. Why is that, why is there such a denial controversy about that? <coughs> it was not the entire population that was aware of that. And it was not the entire population that was a Nazi or was even involved. People, at that time, the media was not what it is today. And we need to put ourselves back into that time period. And, and I'm not sure if you heard the comments. I'm going to uh, repeat, maybe I hope, correct me if I um, don't paraphrase you appropriately. But the comment is that, first of all, the difference between the uh, Hitler youth and the present neo Nazis was that the Hitler youth enjoyed the endorsement and support of the government and was government policy. The present uh, neo-Nazi youths uh, do not enjoy that and they're considered a rump group. The second issue statement uh, was that the, the great deal, a great many Germans who were unaware of what went on in Germany at the time uh, and uh, it's unfair to hold them liable if they were uh, not informed. Sorry, did I paraphrase you correctly? And, and if, even if they were informed, what to, could they do? Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, one, uh, the Catholics in the camp, uh, there were 2,000 Catholic clergy and approximately 400 Protestant clergy incarcerated in Dachau. Uh, a book was written, which we have here, in the Holocaust Center, we have an original edition signed by Father Lentz, who wrote it. He was there from 38 on to 45, called Christ in Dachau. And it's all, the book is in German, but it's also available through libraries in English translation. Number two, as regards to what happened to the SS afterwards, after the war, Martin Bormann, who was about number three in the Hitler hierarchy, uh, escaped by submarine through an underground network, you know, I can't talk about today, uh, to Argentina with $30 million, and then he could put the money in the bank, and that money was used and with Martin Borman at the head to distribute to the uh, German Nazi refugees and set them up in business and so forth. All these documents are in the Holocaust Center. Uh, office copies of the receipt signed by the throne. It comes from a book uh, in English on Martin Borman. The, the essence of the answer is uh, the, the book Christ in Dachau documents the, the uh, uh, number of, uh, of Catholic and uh, pro <coughs> the book uh, Christ in Dachau documents the the Catholic priests who were uh, uh, interned in Dachau, as well as Protestants. And uh, there was some comment about the uh, Bormann who took a great deal of wealth out of Germany. Yes. I'd like to hear the uh, people's response to the culpability of the general German population at the time. Yes, please. 
I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I'd like to hear the people at the table comment about the German people's uh, culpability at that time, generally speaking. The, the question is, they would like to hear your com comments about the German people's cul culpability at the time you... And the area of Germany compared to the United States is, I can't give you an exact comparison, but it's minute, had some 40 camps. We were visible. We were brought in on trains, taken out on trains. There was nothing. There was no civil courage. There was no objection. Civil courage comes expensive. You pay with your life, but sometimes necessary. There was nothing of the sort. The saying that the Germans didn't know, they must have been blind, deaf, and everything else. Because the small children we interviewed after the war, the school children, they admitted that they knew. So how can the parents not have known? When I came to Sachsenhausen in September 39, and we had to march approximately two kilometers to the camp, there was uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of Germans lining the street. And they said to the SS, who are they? And they said, these are the Polish soldiers who cut our soldiers, the tongue out. And we said, of course, it's German. And we spoke in German. No, no, I mean, we are, speak the same language as they. We never said before. And they told us, you shut up. And they hit us with clubs and stones and everything. So quite a few of our people got injured before we even reached the camp. And if you say the population didn't know, Sachsenhausen is for everything one of the oldest and earliest concentration camps. And it is built on the outskirts of Berlin. And the Nazis built a colony of thousands of thousands of new homes for the SS and for party functionaries. Do you think this does not go around the population more and more, what happened in Sachsenhausen, where all these people come from? And if they tell us we are the Polish soldiers, we don't speak a word Polish, we only answer in German. And they still clapped us because they, they wanted only to hear what they wanted to hear. Because in their eyes, we were the Polish soldiers who cut the, our soldiers their tongue out. I was born in this country, as were my parents. In 1942, I was 13 years of age, and my mother told me at that time that the Nazis were systematically murdering Jews in 1942. Now, if my mother knew this, I have difficulty believing that adult Germans were not well aware of this. Other questions? Is there a known figure for uh, Holocaust victims who survived in, were in the United States? I don't think the United States. Of the large ghetto, 10,000 survived in 1946. I think Jews in New York are less than a million that survived after the war. If, if five or six or seven million were killed, and I'm, the numbers are disputed, uh, close to a million survived. And of course, a lot of them went to Israel. Few stayed in Europe and to the United States. Thank you. One last question. Uh, the memory of the Holocaust is getting yeah. older, and uh, some, would, some would say it is, uh, you know, getting fainter, too. Uh, so I would ask you, are you encouraged to come out in this auditorium? The question is, uh, the memory of the Holocaust is fading. I'm encouraged by the turnout uh, for this subject in this auditorium. Well, you complain it's fading. It is, you know, it's, it's been well, a long time. Are you encouraged by the Holocaust is fading? And uh, what they're asking is, are you encouraged by the turnout uh, for this topic in this auditorium? No, I think I'm very grateful for this turnout today. And I think I speak to many schools, and I'm, saying, I'm sure the same is true with Lucille. And uh, many, many students uh, I speak to, they have never heard 
In fact, some of them have never even seen Jews, even in this country, and tremendously taken in what I have to tell them. And, and I think we cannot let these, this whole history die out because we are really the last of the generation. Once we are gone, it has to be read from books. And it will not be the same because there are many deniers already all over which they are saying it never happened. And anybody who is here today can see that I cannot put this number on myself. It is fading already. But I hope it will last as long as I last. towards uh, your religion or towards you know, God among your people through the, the whole ordeal. So we did a lot of people lose faith. The question is, did people in the camps lose faith as a result of their ordeal? I can only speak for myself. I do not believe. Max? Herman. I'm, Max is not here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been calling you Max all. I'm sorry. Well, I have to say, I have never been a very religious person, even so I believe in God. And I'm born a Jew and I'm going to die a Jew. But uh, as far as belief is concerned, I had wondered many times too. And uh, this friend of mine, who is Max Trimmer, who is unfortunately here today, is a very religious person. And I questioned many times because I say, how could that be let happen if anything is higher up than, than we are. Because there are many, many of us so innocent. Why would they have to be murdered like this? For what reason? And unfortunately, it is still going on today in a similar way like it happened then, except it is not a wholesale holocaust like it was with us. But if you see what's going on all over the world, especially in Lithuania, it is horrible. And it is very similar to the times then. Nobody wants to help. And for they, like I said, it is the big United States, but we cannot get involved, although it's impossible if the European who are right there don't want to get involved. Yes. I was wondering if you found any meaning in your suffering or experience? And the question is, have you found meaning in your suffering or experience? Not in suffering, but I found meaning in, in humanity in friends, in other human beings, and in an audience like this who's willing to listen. Um, I still believe in the good of the human being. I sometimes doubt it, but I believe in it. Herman, did you want to come? I believe that we should always forgive, but never forget what has happened to us. And I have no animosity toward any of these young generations. If they are Germans, it, 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 these people have nothing. Because even a few months ago, there was a big discussion on television and the newspapers about the, you know, some of the descendant kids and nephews of the high party officials. Some of you must have seen this, and they were as comments. And some of them even became one or two became Jews living in Israel. So I have nothing against it. These were the kids, they are not responsible. I have nothing against any German. Not even if he was a Nazi, he's not responsible unless he was involved in crimes against our people. My wife is going to give me help for speaking, but I want to tell you the truth. I helped liberate Dachau in World War II. At that time, we didn't know it was a concentration camp. We thought it was a prisoner camp or uh, something. We did not know it was a concentration camp. I found out after I came back to America that that was a concentration camp for food, the people inside. There were only about 40 people in Dachau when I helped break the chain on the ground fence. They had a chain with a lock on it. And it just so happened I was in the uh, laying telephone wires where we had great big bolts for our purposes. But there were only very few people left at Dom. In 1945, I think it was. I'm an old man now, and I forget the time and the year. But I was amazed. I know 
They invited me in. We gave them food. We had sea rations. And uh, they gobbled it up very fast. We had uh, spam in there and stuff like that. But they invited me into the camp. And how it happened, we were along the road of a fence. And people came towards us. And one man said to me, do you understand Jewish? And I said, yes. And now they all gathered around the fence inside, and they were talking to me in Jewish. And of course, I did not cry. I didn't know. I was only there 20 minutes, the whole thing. But they took me inside the barracks, and they were sleeping on straw mattresses, and they had straw pillows. Now, I want to tell you something. I slept on the ground in Germany as a soldier. And I slept on that straw pillow and that straw mattress. And I don't want to, I don't want to be a fool, but at that time, I was so tired, I enjoyed it for a few minutes. I was only there 20 minutes total. But the barracks were clean, what I saw. But the people were very hungry. They were small people, very small. The women were small. The men were small. It seemed like they were just bigger than little boys and girls. That's how I found them. And then I had to leave and leave our job to do it. But it's a terrible thing. Now, someone asked, how do you prove six million? It don't make any difference if it were four million. It's terrible. It is terrible. Could I ask a question about, this has to do with how much the German people knew about what was going on in the camp. Every German citizen, from my understanding, had to carry what was known as an Anand Pass. And that meant that it was an identification card that you had to have on your person, and that you had to really prove that you were non-Jewish for anywhere from three to six generations if you did not have the card. Now, is that not evidence of what was going on? I, I think that's uh, um, having a, 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 an ID does not mean that you know about things going on somewhere else. There were so many bombings going on, so many cities were being bombed, that people were so involved in their own survival. That well, that's like not the only thing that was going on in Germany at the time. I don't like the understanding of the time. If you live in an apartment, and the apartment has 50 units, and let's assume 10 units are occupied by Jews, and all of a sudden the 10, un the 10 apartments are vacant, the furniture remains, the Jews disappear, and Germans move in, take over the furniture, the linen, the whatever. The Jews are gone. Don't you think the question arises, what happened? I mean, this happened in each and every apartment building all through Germany. In what city was it? This was in Ansbach, in Bavaria. How, how, many, how many Jews were in the city of Ansbach? I don't know. Mm. All I know from my childhood, I think I would never want to take anything away from you and your, your suffering and the, the horrible thing that has happened. But I don't think it is fair to teach these young minds sitting in this room that every German knew. I have you seen the film Naughty Girl or Has This Mädchen by Anna Rasmus in Passau? Oh, yes, that I answers know. all your questions. I do know that. One last question. I'm concerned about something that I sense is starting to happen here. And it, it's, it's, this big question that always comes up how, much did the, how many of the Germans knew? And, some people argue that they couldn't know because the news wasn't given to them and so forth. And others say, how could they have possibly not known? 
I think the most productive way to approach this question is I would suggest that Germans, from argument at the very least, admit that they all knew, and then put the more difficult question, what in the world could they then have done once they knew? And that's where uh, uh, your point comes in, that civil courage, especially under a totalitarian dictatorship, is an immensely difficult thing, and you are risking your life. Now, if what we're asking is that all the Germans who knew about the concentration camps should have risked their lives, I would simply put the question to myself and to everybody, you have done that in their situation. I'm not trying to whitewash Germans. They don't deserve what being whitewashed any more than any other people do who allow things to happen that are perpetrated by a government over which they have no control. It's not a question of whitewashing. It's not a question of guilt. It's a question of what are the mechanisms that allow such a situation to come about in the first place where people are being persecuted in huge numbers and when people who, you know, normal people who aren't being persecuted can't help even if they want to. If they were to help, they would be persecuted and very likely killed themselves. This is the incredible dilemma that the people were facing. And it seems to me that this is a more productive area to talk about. You know, how do we deal with the coming into being of such dilemmas and such uh, uh, heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, terrible situations? How do we deal with this such that it can never happen again? It, that makes a lot more sense to me to ask the question that way than to point fingers one way or the other or to overly defend oneself or...